And here's one of the most awkward, clunky segues ever. Our next guest came to Calgary to cover skiing, I believe, to write about skiing. Did you not, Eric DeHadjuk? That is correct. Yes. 1978. Okay, not 1946. That's yeah. them. They've been around for a while. And here, we, and here you are. Welcome home. Yes. Yes. Well, it's nice to be back. And I was thinking, I haven't been out skiing yet this year. And still time. Con conditions look pretty good. And uh, I'm going to have to wrap my head around the fact that uh, I want to drive into winter. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but no, you're right. In 1978, uh, I had just graduated from journalism school. I was a summer student at the Toronto Star, but looking for a full-time job. And they had a hiring freeze on. And the Calgary Albertan, long live the Calgary Albertan, yeah. Lynn Watson was the sports editor at the time. And I've told you this story before, but maybe not on the air, that, uh, you know, he called me. Like, I'm a Toronto kid, right? Yeah. So, uh so he said, uh, do you, you know, how do you feel about skiing? I said, well, my, you know, my parents emigrated from Austria. We, we have done a fair bit of skiing in our lives. And uh, he says, good, because I need a ski rider. All my guys want to cover curling. Now, again, as a, as a Toronto <laughs> guy, I thought he was making a joke. So I did, did the obligatory. <laughs> and then there was like five seconds of dead air. And I thought, hmm, I may have made a mistake. <laughs> well, of course, once you know, I've been in Calgary 45 years, I soon learned that Curling is a very serious <laughs> e enterprise here. Yes. And, and, but I also realized that why they needed a ski reporter was because you did have to get out to the mountain. And in those days, it wasn't like it is today. You know, you had to stand at the, the bottom of the hill with your notepad, no tape recorders, no cell phones, you know, jotting down notes, interviewing people in the cold. Your pens are freezing. Yet you ended up, you know, the, one of the first things I learned was bring a pencil because a pencil wouldn't freeze. Right. Now, a pencil tip could break. But anyway, it, it was just a, a different time. And I really enjoyed it. I honestly, I tell people all the time that those first two years, um, while I was making nickels and dimes, were two of the most enjoyable years that I ever had, uh, because that was the heyday of the crazy Canucks. Yep. I got to know Ken Reed quite well. We're only three weeks apart in age, so we have a lot of shared background. And, uh, and it was... Ken Reed's prowess on, on the World Cup circuit that got me assigned to cover the Olympics in Lake Placid in, in 1980. So as the, the, the junior man on, on, on any staff is not going to be assigned a plum assignment like that, but, but Reed was a favorite in, in the downhill. And, and because the Albertan was a small publication that could only send one reporter, they said, we're sending you, but then you're also going to have to cover the men's Olympic hockey team and figure skater Brian Pokar. So I traveled with that 79-80 Olympic team, which had Glenn Anderson yeah. on it, Jimmy Nill, Paul McLean, Tim Waters, Randy Craig, it was a really good team, and um, I, I actually saw the Americans that won the gold medal in 1980 play seven times before the Olympics. And I checked with a lot of my American colleagues, and most of them had only ever seen them play once or twice, and some not at all before they got to, to Lake Placid. In fact, if you watch the movie Miracle, you know there's a scene where Herb Brooks is feuding with reporters all the time. Well, I, I was one of them. Herbie was really mad at me one time because I wrote a kind of a a, a critical game story, not just of the Americans, but of the Canadians, because there was a brawl at the at the corral during the series they had here. I think it was the game where Bob Suter broke his leg and had to be carried off the ice. So uh, anyway, uh, the skiing gig at the very beginning of my career got me into the hockey gig. And then, you know, after the Olympics in, in 1980, which was, you know, an, an incredible event to cover as a 24-year-old kid, um, the Flames arrived nine months later and, uh, you know, I've been covering the NHL rest, ever since. Rest yeah. of they say is history. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, I. there's three things. As a ski reporter, mm -hmm. you just covered races and results, but uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't travel, right? You would just go to the mountains here? Uh, yeah, in, in the beginning, but I, I did go to Whistler in 1979. Okay. There, there was, that was supposed to be the first World Cup race, not in in, in, in Europe. Right? Okay. So that was, that was right around the era where, you know, before Canada had hosted any world cup races and, and, and Ken, Ken Reed was a, a big part of, yeah. uh, of promoting that along with, uh, I think it was Serge Lang who was running the, uh, the international ski federation at the time. And, uh, and I did go out and, and cover, uh, the race in Whistler, but it ultimately was canceled because, because of a lack of snow. It was, it was uh, right at the end of the year. Gotcha. And, uh, so you talk about great assignments <laughs> for four days, I think to Whistler skied every day and, <laughs> and there was no event to cover. So I, I ended up writing nothing but postponements, which was, you know, um, not great for the newspaper, right. but for, you know, the kid that was out there skiing on somebody else's dime, it was, 
it was pretty great. So, but the other thing is to, to just to, to complete yeah. the thought, there there was also a um, what's the word for it? A promotional side to, to the thing because every Tuesday the Calgary Alberta and I believe the Herald did the same thing had 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 a ski page because yeah. there were a lot of a lot of uh, all, all of the, the resorts and, and plus the you know the, the yep. ski seller sure. and all of the manuf the manufacturers they all advertised in the newspaper in those days and there had to be content that would support those ads so so you would also uh, you know spend part of your week writing that so there yes there were events to cover mm -hmm. uh, to, I guess the honest to God truth is that probably the promotional stories were most important for the business plan of, sure. of the newspaper. Those were the things that they, they right. cared the most about, but, uh, uh, but th they were all always fun to write too, and uh, and, and uh, you know I got interested in, in equipment because of that. I remember in those days the downhill racers. There was a period of time where they had these little notches in, in the in the tips of the skis, and it was to create you know a, a better you know Airflow. A, a aerodynamics yeah, yeah. Uh, to it. And I remember asking Ken Reed about that. I said it looks you know crazy, and he said, well, you know they've tested it in the early versions of wind tunnels and and you know you get it you pick up a tenth here and a tenth there and and i soon realized that in that sport if you can pick up a tenth here and a tenth there that's the difference between being on the podium and being sixth right so olympic hockey teams brawled they did in that particular one you know there, there, there was a that wasn't common though no, 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 okay, no, no, okay, exactly. Okay. And that, that yeah. was, the, if I remember, I wish I had it in front of me, but if I remember, that was the premise of the piece. You know, this is, you know, that yeah. was the, you know, that was, you know, a couple of years after the the, the Broad Street bully. So the, the you know, the, the NHL game was, was as rough and tumble as, as it's ever been at, at that stage. And the mm -hmm. whole idea of, of international hockey was it was supposed to be a purer version of it. And right. the American players were all college players. And, and a lot of the Canadian players have been recruited from, uh, from the U S college system. But, but it just goes to show Rob that, you know, rivalries uh, can uh, elicit real emotion. And, and those teams didn't really like each other. That was one of the really uh, unfortunate things about that competition, because those teams played some great, games against each other um you know people in calgary had a chance to see three of them i think i saw one in hibbing and uh and fargo at, at the <laughs> university of north dakota campus there I, you know again as, as a young kid sure getting a chance to to go to these different venues was absolutely fascinating and and, and really um illuminating um but but there was some really really fun hockey played by those teams and then they never met in the olympics because the canadian team was eliminated before that crossover thing again the format of the olympics in those days there was no actual playoff the two top teams from each pool advanced you didn't play the team from your own pool again you just crossed over and played the other two teams and at the end of it it was whoever had the you know the the best record and that's yeah. why the americans after they beat the russians on that friday afternoon still had to go back on the sunday and beat finland i don't know if people really like how, how many, many people, people realize lots that? of people have forgotten that yeah. everyone thinks that the miracle on ice took place on the friday which it did because that's al michaels you know do you believe in miracles but if they had not been able to defeat finland on the final sunday you know russia could have, exactly. could have still slid in and yeah. got the gold yeah so what a crazy and, story well and and it was partly because of that uh that ultimately you know the the olympic format and the world championship format uh were changed you know they used to just be you know points in the standings and you got to a situation like you did in, in the calgary olympics in 1988 where russia had won the gold medal before the final game and put up a half hearted effort in that final game lost and and you know it, it affected the the, the final medal standing. So uh, I think at that point, uh, um, you know, the, the International Ice Hockey Federation realized that they needed to adopt more of a single elimination uh, format. And, and I think that's what hockey fans like too. Yeah. The third thing. Okay. It's Perfect. amazing that you can remember the third thing. Cause I would have, if I had no, said three, it, there are three things I would have forgotten the second and the third first thing instantly. The first thing <laughs> I, I thought for some reason, I thought you were going to tell me that you had to go measure the snow for the snow report. Oh, no. The, no, no. Okay. No, so you no, didn't no. have to do that. No, I, I didn't do snow reports. Other people did. Snow reports were a big deal. They were well, a big especially deal, Especially right? on radio. I mean, yeah, you know absolutely. That. And yeah. and in the, you know, in the newspaper, it'd be part of the sports sure. column, yeah. right? I, I did not have to do okay. that. Thankfully, Thankfully. That, would have been, that would have involved getting up early, right? Right. Well, yeah. exactly. <laughs> the brawl of the corral involving two Olympic teams. The third is, tell me, uh, tell me about Herb Brooks. Be and the reason I asked that question is, I don't know what to think. I know people who played for him at the NHL level yeah. and he was not popular. And we both know coaches that aren't popular, but are successful. What, 
you know, what was Herb Brooks like to cover? What was he like to be around? Well, so, you know, it was for me, it was a different experience in 1980 uh, covering, you know, what he would consider the, you know, the, the team that the opposing team, um, you know, very brusque and difficult to deal with. Well, what happened was so, <laughs> so after that column ran, he wouldn't talk to me. So what he used to do was he'd send Craig Patrick out. <clears throat> Craig Patrick was the assistant coach. Craig Patrick became a very influential person in, in the national hockey no league. No kidding. And yeah. I, I got to know Craig Patrick because <laughs> he was the guy that was coming. And, I, you know, again, we were traveling. The Herald wasn't. So so a lot of times there'd be one reporter at these things. And it was, it was you. this guy. <laughs> and and Herbie wouldn't talk to me. So, so you know, it would be Craig that would come out. And, and you know, he was never a great interview. But, you know, when you start to develop mm -hmm. a relationship with someone that early on, you know, it, it, it helps. Sure. You know, you eventually ended up running the Rangers and hired Herb to, her to coach the team. But what I will tell you, though, is that our relationship relationship changed and evolved and at the end um we were you know we we were well acquainted and and there was no issues at all like we you know i think after a while we'd just both been at it for a long period of time and and uh i don't know you know uh, i mean it was, it was a different era in those days yes. rob because yeah I, I mean every like to do this job you have to have a certain backbone right and 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 there's, you know, some people in the industry like and respect that. And some people in the industry mm -hmm. don't want that. They want to steamroll you. And so if you put your hand up and say no or, you know, or write something that's critical. And of course, in those days, too, it's not like today where, you know, a lot of things are done remotely. If you wrote a critical story on player X or coach Y, the next morning you were down at the practice so that they could let you have Absolutely. it. I mean, it was, it was it was just a different era. So you yeah. developed the thick skin, and that was just part of part of the job. But but I'll never. The, the other thing that I remember most about about Herb was so you know he had this this great career, and then he came back and he coached the American team in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, the Americans had a really great round robin, mm -hmm. and they were they were you know the hometown team. They were they were favored to win. Canada had a very um, you know, circuitous route to Gretzky the final. Calling out people, right? yeah, 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 and uh, you know, and then and then you know, Belarus upset Sweden, and now the Canadians don't have to play Sweden in, in, yeah. in the in the in the semis, and then they get to the final and and they beat the Americans in a you know in a very dramatic fashion. So one of the great stories of my life, you know, Canada. Uh, I was writing for the Globe and Mail in those days, so you know, writing for the national newspaper. The, it's been 50 years since Canada won a gold medal. You're in Salt Lake City, 90 seconds to go, and spontaneously people start singing the Canadian national anthem. Very, very cool. Um, afterwards, Wayne Gretzky reveals the, the the tale of the loony. As a writer, you raise your hand and say, "Okay, thank you very much." We, we, we <laughs> ding, can, ding, ding! We We've got can, a winner. We, we can work with that. So, but so. You know, the next day, or I think it was even two days later because it was so difficult to get out of there. Um, we're leaving Salt Lake City. The airport is jammed. Security is is really tight because this is soon after 9-11, right? Yeah. So so it was a really, it was a difficult Olympics to cover on that level because security was so ramped up. There was there was just a fear of, of terrorist attacks. Everybody was was on pins and needles throughout the, the whole competition. So imagine two uh, long security lines and everybody has to go through them, whether you're the coach of the American team or, or just a writer covering it. So Al Strachan and I are in the left line and Herb Brooks is over there in the right line and he sees us and he waves and he comes over to our line and he's upset because of that story that had made the rounds about the, the American women stomping on on the canadian flag and he was so upset oh, really he was so upset so he came over and he said our girls would never do that that is just that's just false and so we thought you know we, you know we were sort of you know you know great tournament herbie you know great <laughs> great swan sign everything else. and that was the one thing that was on his mind and it yeah. was just and 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 i had to believe you know like that 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 it had to be true because he was so worked up about it and and you know we yeah we you know he, he's like a lot of people after about you know five minutes that you know the steam engine slows down and and away you go but i was struck by that so strack and i are there and herbie's over there and and that's what that was what was on his mind the day after this really heartbreaking loss sure. for the americans and that's where it's in salt lake yeah so i i mean i had a great admiration for him mm -hmm. um you know, he was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. I was yeah. on the selection committee when uh, when he was elected. Uh, yeah, he was a, he was a, an, an interesting character, and um, yeah, I think I thought you know the uh, you know there's there's been several movies made um, 
I remember the Carl Malden one didn't really ring true. Okay. Um, the, the, the other one, Miracle? Uh, yeah, with, uh, with Kurt Russell was closer to my perception of, of what went on there. But having said that, I wasn't, you know, in the rinks with Team USA in Europe when he was doing those skating drills. But he, he, he was a hard man. Yeah. He was a hard man. And the other thing, I guess, is that when Bob Johnson came here to coach, uh, in in 1982, uh, and he became the first American to, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to coach in Canada, and you know that kind of paved the way for for Herb Brooks to get it get into the NHL. They were longtime college rivals, and really didn't like each other. Oh, really? Oh, they really they aren't the same person. Really didn't like <laughs> each other. And and someone told me at the time that the only time they ever saw the two of them smile at the same time was at Mark Johnson's wedding. Really? That, that that Herbie was invited and uh, and uh, so they now whether you know that continued but but in the beginning there was a, that that rivalry from the U.S. college ranks spilled over uh, in, in into the NHL and you're right their their personalities were completely different Herb Herb had one approach which you know most people saw it in the movie and then Bob Johnson was the opposite I mean yeah. the way Bob Johnson coached then yeah you see a lot of that now right the player you know the so-called players coach the you know, we're, oh, we're, he was way ahead of time. way ahead of his time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But but he, but it was an anomalous for the NHL sure. at the time. Yeah. And yeah. and it took some of the players a, a long time to adjust to to that voice and, and that approach because most of them had come through the system. You know, junior hockey, it was tough, 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 and now you're in the NHL. So so all of a sudden you have this Mister Positive, and and you know, like a lot of, I think in the beginning, there was a certain amount of suspicion. Was it being put on? Yeah. As you got to know Bob Johnson, you realized that was just the fabric of the man. That, that's just who he was. You know, right. he, he didn't have a, uh, you know, an artificial bone in his body. He would just, he would show up in the morning, you know, and, you know, everybody would be dead tired and he'd be, you know, it's a great day. For, I, I mean, that was literally true. He, that whole, it's a great day for hockey. That I must have heard it a hundred times uh, out of his mouth on days when, when it didn't feel like a great day for hockey, it didn't feel like a great day for an early flight. It didn't feel like a great day for anything. And he's in there pepping everybody up. It was, it was quite an extraordinary couple of years uh, traveling with him and, and and covering Bob Johnson for sure. This is why you're the first guy I called when I said I'm coming back. And I'm <laughs> Just no, to tell because, the old stories. No, no. But I was going to ask you about Kurt Russell, yeah. and you got there yeah. because there's not a lot of hockey movies where we can go. Well, I knew him, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're able. Carl Malden, great actor, yeah. wrong guy. Yeah. Um, Daryl Sutter becomes uh -huh. the uh, coach with the most games behind the bench, passing uh -huh. Bob Johnson yesterday. Yeah. Peter Marr and I were talking about it. Mm -hmm. We got to Bob Johnson through Herb Brooks. Yeah. Now you can tell one of my favorite stories. Okay. What's which one is that? <laughs> the um, losing streak and and uh, oh, the Bob Hartford calling one. calling yeah. you and uh, shaky in. Oh yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, it was just the the, the usual post game. So um, yes. So in 1986, the year that eventually the Flames made it to the Stanley Cup final for the first time. They had, uh, you know, one of the one of the longest losing streaks in, in in team history. It was it ended up being eleven games. The eleventh game was a was a nightmarish loss to to the Hartford Whalers. Yep. I remember Dean Evison had a had a really strong game that day. David Babich had a strong game. They lit up Reggie Lemelin, and, and uh, you know the the quotes from the Hartford dressing room was just a whole lot of sympathy for for Lemelin because he played so so well for them for so many years. Um, and again, in those days. Uh, you interviewed the coach in his office after the game. Right. So, you know, now we you have the banners yeah, and, and, and so stuff. on and so forth, scrums, um, in-house media. It, it's it's crowded and, and it's very formulaic. But in those days, you know, the you you walk in and Bob's behind the desk, stands up, and George and I are on the other side of the desk, and we're the only two writers in there. And uh, and and I, I want to say before we even had a chance to ask a question, or we were starting to mumble something <laughs> about like, is this the bottom, or you know, some mm -hmm. you know the generic question that you might ask in that situation. He just goes off on too much is being made of our so-called slump and and that just stopped george and i in our tracks because they had you know they had lost like it was a horrible loss they had lost 11 in a row or whatever it was and 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 they were just sinking fast i mean that was it that they were having a really good season up until the middle of december and all of a sudden now it's the middle of january and yeah. and, and nobody can put two feet in front of each other anymore and so it was it, it, as i say we were we were paralyzed because 
what else can you say? And uh, it's funny you, you mentioned that because I was just rereading. Uh, George Johnson did a book, The 100 Things You Need to Know About the Flames, and that was one of the 100 things. And I was just rereading his account of it, and, and it, it, it jived completely with uh, with my memory of it, too. There are certain things, like so much blurs in 45 sure years, does. but some things just stand out as if it happened yesterday and I can still hear him saying that and and we were practically on the floor I don't think we were laughing but we were just I mean I can't think of another way of putting it we were paralyzed because this was just the the ultimate example of of Bob trying to spin a negative into a positive and and actually that was the last game they lost they you know they won the next game I believe 5-4 they'd called up Mike Vernon and they got back on their feet yeah. and then the next thing you know you know that your friend perry barazan scores the, <laughs> the you know, greatest goal in flames history the greatest goal in flames history and they're in the stanley cup final with vernon against patrick Waugh talking to his goal post again pretty remarkable season to cover for sure but as someone who never met or covered bob johnson okay. it goes back to what you said about the fabric of that story i believe to be <laughs> The man, yeah. like there was no pretense. He wasn't, no. you know, we get yelled at by coaches all the time, or you guys are making a mountain out of a molehill. Yeah. He truly believed. Oh yeah. <laughs> they were not in a slump. <laughs> he thought we were exaggerating. Well, and I will say this, you know, that the, the, they lost five in a row before Christmas and, uh, and then they went on the Christmas break and they were really unlucky. Like some of those losses were sure. really unlucky. Yeah. It, it, it shouldn't have, it shouldn't have, they shouldn't have lost, but they did, you know, a bad goal, a bad break goalie standing on his head. So they're at, you know, five losses in a row and not really playing all that badly. But then the next six games, they really started playing badly. So, <laughs> so they played when, to the level <laughs> when, when all was said and done, it added up to no points in the standings for close to a month. Well, you know, that, that can undermine you. you yeah. Know? And again, yeah. a different time, you know, I, I think in a 32 team NHL, if you went a month without getting a point, that would probably eliminate you from the playoffs. But you did have the opportunity in the 21 team NHL to recover because 16, 16 the playoffs. Yeah. 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 Um, to Daryl in the 401 games, yeah. tip of the hat, it's always something when you are the, the leader in franchise history. Should we talk more about the franchise history? That, that a team that's been around for 40 plus years, the most games that a coach has ever coached behind the bench is 401 and counting? Isn't that a little off? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on how you look at the profession of coaching. You know, so there's the the one way of looking at it is it's the co it's the hired to be fired profession, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of that here. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's been you know other situations like uh, you know Nashville coming yeah. into the league and you know the turn of the century, and it was basically Barry Trotz there for a while and. Peter Laviolette, now John Hines. So, you know, a lot of stability, um, no championships. Yep. Came close a few times, had yep. some, had some, you know, President's Trophy winning teams and some some very good teams, but, but never got over the top. So I, I would say that there's no one right or wrong way. Um, and, and you, you know, you know, think, so a, a week and a half ago, I was in uh, Anaheim and had an opportunity to speak at length with, Jared Bednar, mm -hmm. um, and for a story that I'll publish in the Athletic uh, at some point before the playoffs about you know the challenges of, of, of defending, and one of the things that came up in the conversation was, you know, his first year behind the bench was one of the worst seasons in modern NHL history, forty-eight points, yep. and uh, and and he was you know hired at kind of at the eleventh hour, and he was kind of. He was, he was kind of an unknown. We knew him, you know, because of his, uh, you know, the ties being, here, being yeah. an assistant in Abbotsford. And, yeah. uh, and he had won uh, in the AHL with uh, Cleveland uh, the year before. So he, he had, you know, and, and he was one of those people that I really admire because I, I, I like, I, I admire the success stories of someone that touches every rung on the ladder up there. So think about, you know, his playing career, you know, you know, four junior teams over a three year period. And then, you know, all those years in minor pro yep. and then, you know, 11 years of apprenticing for the, I mean, he, he, he did not take, you know, the, <laughs> he did know, not take the did, express. He, well, he didn't take the elevator. No, to the he top. sure he, did he not. He touched every rung on yep. the ladder. And then his first opportunity, you know, the team has 48 points and it's just a disaster. So, you know, Good for Joe Sackett, the manager there, you know, trusting in his original decision, realizing that that was one of those years where everything that could go wrong did go wrong mm -hmm. and stuck with him. And, you know, I think it was, you know, about it was only a few days after I talked to him that he'd signed that contract extension and he's going to be making millions of dollars for, for, for a number of, uh, of years going forward. So I do think that 
having faith in in your decision you know d did we hire the right guy and if it doesn't work out right away you know do we want to push him to the exit or do we want to give him another opportunity and i think that you know what colorado did with jared bednar should be a, a lesson for for lots of teams that sometimes you you know you, you don't take the expedient path but but you take what you think is the right path and stick with someone and, and let them find themselves at the NHL level. And by the way, you can also help them by getting them better players. Well, <laughs> it, that's a huge part. And, and you know how I would illustrate that is when Jay Feaster brought Bob Hartley on, yeah. a young John Cooper was kind of, you know, in the weeds and, and would be hired eventually by Tampa. And I yeah. think he just celebrated 10 years as the head coach of the Tampa Bay Lightning, right? Yeah, yeah. he's had a pretty good run there too. He's right? not bad, yeah. 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 But, you know. But, but again, surrounded by the right player. Sure, and, and you know, when you think about it, it, like John Cooper was the second young coach that they hired there. Yep. And, uh, and the first one didn't really work out, right? So, you know, I, I think that that's, um, you know, it, it, it is an inexact science and you don't know how a, a coach's message is going to resonate and then and then you don't know how long it will resonate because eventually, uh, even for the best coaches, it, it, it runs out and, and then you yep. have to make a change. But, uh, um, but yeah, there's just so many different ways of going about coaching. So back to your original thing, like uh, it is important that, you know, that you, you know, you set a franchise record for, uh, um, you know, for, for, for coaching. And now, you know, in Daryl's case, it was over, you know, like two, two, two different stints. Exactly. Yeah. So that might, <laughs> it's a little odd <clears throat> Well, or it changes it a little bit. I mean, yeah. you know, that, that's that you, can you go home again? Well, you know, I guess you can. Um, it's been an interesting week for the local hockey heroes, um, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I, um, uh, I said it off the top today. Last night was the team that I thought we were going to see. Uh, the goalie played like the goalie we mm -hmm. thought we were going to see. Yeah. It, it, it also, we did a show yesterday where we were talking about that Chicago game and just baffled by it all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they, they do not hold the, they, they don't control their own destiny now. No. That, that's something they've given up. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I just don't even know where to start anymore. Yeah, and and I'm glad you, you that's your starting point because I don't know where to to take it from here to be honest with you because it's the same thing you know that there was a part of me because the, this has been such an upside down year I, I said to somebody uh, um, I said you, you know here's what will happen they'll lose to Chicago they'll beat Winnipeg and and because that that's been that's, that's been the year. that's the year exactly yeah. you know so the game you should win you lose the game you know like you know you're traveling uh, they're waiting for you uh, you know they have as much on the line as you do uh, you know they can put you away and they find a way of winning that game and they find a way of losing the other game so again we're in the analysis business so we're trying to come up with with good logical rational explanations for for why things have unfolded the way they have this year and and I'm I'm like you I'm baffled I I really don't know now I would say this you know that, that, that you know that a lot of times when when a when a team has a year like that and and Winnipeg's had a couple of months like that too. yes you know, they have when you think about where yep. they were I mean they were the top team in the conference for a period January of time 18th. right there yeah and then all of a sudden now they're on the cusp of, of missing the playoffs so how did it go off the rails so badly I. In the days when I was actually covering a team, traveling with the team, in the dressing room with the team, you you could pick up on mm -hmm. on the nuances, and and I'm not that anymore oh. with the Flames. So I'm I've got that arm's length view of it, and it does look like there were times when 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 the message of the of the coach was just being completely tuned out, and and I also think that you know the onus is on you know the way that the game is and the way that's governed by a salary cap, the onus is on your highest paid players to produce at a level commensurate with, with their salary. And, yeah. and I don't think, you know, I think any reasonable hockey fan will look at the way Jonathan Huberto has played, the way Nazem Kadri has played and, and they haven't, they haven't done that and you know even someone like elias lindholm just seems like a different player this mm -hmm. year i mean he still has the great defensive chops and but but when he scored when, 40 last year when he had the puck in the slot last year it was in the net he's got the puck in the slot this year he's missing them yeah it, and it's just it's not you know he, he hasn't performed at the level that, that he did a year ago and yes he doesn't have matthew kachuk and he doesn't have johnny Kudrow. obviously that those mm -hmm. are factors and yeah. uh but i think too that you know last year when that line got going you could it, it just exuded confidence every night out like, you know they, i mean everybody has a handful of of off nights over the course of a season but they didn't have very many like they they were 
really you know a lot of people last year said that's the best line in hockey and mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be hard to dispute that there yep. would be like analytics to support it and the eye test would support it absolutely so and and he was a critical piece he was the center on that line he, he was a critical piece so you know the the level that he was at last year he hasn't been at and um you know it almost feels like they've you know like thank goodness for tyler to foley you know I'm, I'm I'm not sure. And Michael Backlund. Yeah, and Backlund has been fantastic. But if you go back to the trade that they made for Toffoli last year to give up a first round pick, and I remember Brad Tree Living saying at the time that one of the things that we like about this is not a rental. You know, he's a guy with term at a, at a at a reasonable term and a guy that has a history with Daryl Sutter, and and then mm -hmm. so there won't be that adjustment period because you know sometimes it, it is difficult yep. for players that have played for say a, a John Cooper type or a Paul Maurice type to. To adjust to to Daryl's style, you know, mm -hmm. which is more along the lines of what Mike Keenan used, how Mike Keenan used to coach or Scotty Bowman, and uh, but with Toffoli, knowing you know uh, what he was getting, they they felt that there was a, a very sm there wasn't much of a risk there, and and that has proven to be a true assessment. Like that that has been one of the better trades that that has been made here in, in a number of years. He's come in and been everything they hoped he'd be, and a little bit more. What about Winnipeg? I mean, here we are talking about Calgary. In a way, you know, Calgary's underachieved. Did Winnipeg overachieve in the first part of the season? You know, I don't know. That I mean, that's a really good question because I like I've I've Winnipeg has puzzled me for for the longest period of time. Ever since you know that that year that they uh, they got to the final four and then lost to Vegas and then Vegas lost to Washington in the Stanley mm -hmm. Cup final. I, I've always right. felt that they've had a, a like a, a team on paper that that should be competitive every year and they've been up and down good and goalie yeah so you have a guy that's perennially in the conversation for for the Vezina um you know obviously you know when they had to move away from the Dustin Bufflins and the Ben Sherrods mm -hmm. and and the Tyler Byers when those guys were in their primes and it was really just Josh Morrissey that was left there that the blue line was thin for a while but I think that they've reinforced that by bringing in you know the the peons and the and and the Nate Schmitz and then and the Demellos. So I, I I think their blue line is is more than adequate. And and you know when their position players are all healthy on paper, they have one of the strongest you know one to nine groups of, of forwards in, in the National Hockey League. So and and you know two years ago they weren't very good, and then for the first half of this year they were. And a lot of it was the coaching change and you know breath of fresh air with Rick Bonus coming in and yeah. Paul Maurice had left us a little high and dry. That was what what the players were saying and um and then all of a sudden the bottom fell out so i they that just looks to me like a team that doesn't respond to the moment particularly well and then you know all of a sudden you know they they played a couple of games where they they looked like uh you know the team that they they needed to be you know they just you know had, had two outstanding efforts uh and then last night just okay so i i think that there's a fragility yep. uh, to that team um but i also think that they're they're kind of sneaky dangerous because mm -hmm. if uh, if they get into the playoffs they could be one of those teams that says okay you know uh, i know break wheel is not the captain anymore but i think that he is a big believer in that you know us against the world thing yep. And I think that that's how that's the drum that you will, that they will beat if they get into the playoffs. No one believes in us except us, uh, the, the players in, in in the dressing room. And let's go out and show them. And if you start, if you play with you know essentially a pressure in a pressure free environment, we you just look at the teams at the bottom of the standings right now. That you know with the young kids coming in, and all of a sudden you know Chicago's winning games that they're not supposed to, and then San Jose is winning games they're not supposed to, and Arizona has won way more games than, than they, they than they were supposed to. <laughs> yeah. And so you know th th there's no question in my mind that uh, that playing you know like a light and carefree brand of hockey just frees everybody up to play their games sure and the opposite of that is is when you're feeling that pressure it it, it weighs on you it's there's a heaviness and 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 when you have that heaviness on you it slows you down and all of a sudden you know on the nights when the flames haven't looked very good they look slow right yep. and i think that's yep. just the, the heaviness of expectations that's uh that's weighing on them a little bit so you know i often think about and I've said this a couple of times. In fact, I brought it up with Daryl Sutter when I saw him in California a couple of weeks ago that people have forgotten that in 2012, when the Kings won the Stanley Cup, they made it as the eighth seed. Um, they they were touch and go to make the playoffs, but they ultimately made it by, I think, five points. I looked it up today. Were they down to San Jose in the first round, too? That was the next that was in year. 2014. Okay. Okay. So the year that they won in 2014, they yeah. were they were on the ropes and they had one of those miracle comebacks, right. but, in, but the no, the 2012 was the year that once they made the playoffs, they, they, I think they, they yeah, they only lost a handful of games yeah, the rest of the right. way. They, they were the eighth seed. They Vancouver was the top seed. 
they went in and just rolled over over Vancouver and then they they just they, they, nobody really gave them a run that year they, they went from being a team that, that was an eighth seed you know or the second wild card if, if that's the terminology you prefer and and they rolled over everybody yeah. and so uh you know sometimes you know people say well you know teams are built for playoffs la was that kind of hard heavy team um but uh i, I think about the year that uh, that nashville made it to the stanley cup final they were an eight seed and they mm -hmm. took out chicago in, in the first mm -hmm. round columbus was an eight seed and, and took out uh Took out Tampa, Tampa Bay that one year. Yep. Uh, Colorado was an eight seed in, in in 2019 and took out, you know, in Kale McCarr's first year, took out Calgary. So, you know, the, the, on paper, it makes no sense. I'm sitting there trying to think, okay, how can you, you know, like how is, how is Florida going to beat Boston? Well, here's the thing, you know, uh, you know, Boston's had this amazing year. Last year, they were a wild card, you know, and Florida was the top seed. So this year, their roles are, are going to be reversed. practically reversed. Yeah. Florida will, you know, I think they're going to make it and if they do, but they'll make it as a wild card that just barely creeps into the playoffs. And Boston has been, you know, almost coasting this last little while, you know, I think Taylor Hall is coming back soon. Mm -hmm. um, they're resting David Krejci, you know, most of the dispatches from Boston are, you know, uh, so-and-so could play tonight if it was a play game but you know why run the risk right. well you know uh, we've seen that happen in calgary before where a team that has uh, you know clinched early took the foot off the pedal and could never get, get it back. back it couldn't no. get back up to 60 again after no. that so so i mean that's what makes the, the playoffs the you know the intriguing animal that that they are that uh you know, even if you just go back the last, you know, five or six years, somebody somewhere is doing something they're not supposed to. The, the, the year of the Canadian division, you know, Montreal and Winnipeg were clearly, <laughs> you know, uh, the inferior teams. And, you know, they both won and, and you well, know, Winnipeg and swept, didn't they? And 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 the Montreal was in in the Stanley Cup final as, yeah. the, as they were the they were fourth in that in the division. Yeah, and, you know, and so uh, uh, you know, uh, this is th this is why I don't gamble because uh, because <laughs> yeah. because I, I don't I wouldn't have the uh, you know I I couldn't handle it I couldn't handle it you know because every everything is so logical and it points in one obvious direction, and yet you know two weeks later it's like really Boston eliminated mm -hmm. you know and but that's what we said about Tampa. And, the year that they faced Columbus in the first round there, you know, they, they had one of the, the greatest regular seasons in history and they were out in nine days, Yep. you know, so yep. Anything can happen, which I guess is why we watch. Um, was Tuesday the last time Jonathan Tabes plays in Cal played in Cal will play in Calgary. Yeah. Is, is this the end? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, publicly he's saying that he wants to, to mull over his decision in, in the summer. And I think that's wise and mm -hmm. prudent. Uh, you know, it's been another difficult year for him. Uh, it, you know, like he, he missed that entire year because of long COVID and then he came back and, you know, for a while was playing at a reasonable uh, level, not to the level that he once was at, but still, you know, a contributing player. And then, you know, all of a sudden he had another setback. And so, you know, I think he wants to, I, I think he, he wants to, and, and he deserves uh, the ability to just sort of look inside himself and, and, and say, you know, do I still have the motivation? Because the one thing that I will tell you that, that, that in the abstract, every NHL player will, will say is that, you know, when they're approaching that career crossroads and they're con considering retirement, it's not even so much the games in October that, that matter because they, they all still love playing the games and they're ready to play the games and they get the adrenaline going for the games. It's those intermediate steps you have to take in the summer away from the spotlight yeah. where you're up in the morning and you're in the gym and you're working out and you're getting yourself into the condition that you need to be in even just to get to training camp. And then yeah. you have the training camp and then you have the season and that's, that's where the motivation disappears. It's, it's July and, and you know the golf course is beckoning, and you've got the you know the the new tailor-made driver is in your bag, and and the trainer wants you in there, yeah. you know, doing you know the medicine ball workout, and 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 that's honestly that's you know a lot of times when the decision is made. No, I'm trying out that new driver, so we'll see. I if you're asking me to to guess, I I, I think this probably is is the end uh, for him. Um, it would be different if he hadn't won three championships in, in six years. He's I won Olympic that. gold medal. I mean, that, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing really left for him to prove professionally. And, um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, and, and I think he's, you know, that's the other thing about Jonathan Taze is a pretty well-rounded guy, right? Mm -hmm. has a lot of diverse interests. A lot of times people keep playing because they have no interest other than hockey. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't have the game, 
they have to find something to do in the game. Where do whether, they go? Yeah. Whether it be in broadcasting, coaching, scouting, you know, there's there's lots of other jobs affiliated with the game. But but I suspect that he'll be somebody that that uh, you know he's interested in green initiatives. That you know he's a complex, interesting guy who is probably ready readier than than a lot of people for the next uh, the next stage of his life. I, I, I was asking Peter Marr about this because I'm I'm fascinated by what people view as his legacy. And maybe it's only because I, it's it's so rock solid for me. I know he won Stanley Cups. I know he won Olympic medal. But man, when him, when he and and Kane came to town, yeah. that franchise blossomed mm -hmm. and it became because you know what it was like before sure. that. I mean, two thousand fans on a weekend, yeah. no home games on TV, and all that. Now yeah. they're not ultimately responsible for those things, but they were the face of that team that came back. Like I think his legacy is is almost making the Blackhawks relevant in Chicago again. Yeah, that, well, that's a good point. I, I, and I don't think a legacy has to be a single thing. No, that's so, true. And, Fair enough. And yeah. so, so I think that, that, that there will be a number of things like when, you know, when, when, when he gives his hall of fame speech, uh, you know, uh, I think that he will touch on, on, on all those things or, or, mm -hmm. or certainly the people talking about him will touch on all those things, but, but no, but that's a, that's an important one to, to discuss, I think, because, um, we all know what he did in, on, on those Stanley cup, uh, yep. teams. We all know what he did, uh, in, in the Olympics. Uh, you know, he was, I mean, he was such a catalyst on, on, on that Olympic team. You know, when you have the best of the best in Canada, and then he is still one of the elite players yes. in that group, that, that, tells you something about his yep. his contributions but you're right and again so i was working at the globe and mail at the time and and i was one of the very early people that went in there before people knew who john mcdonough was or jay blunk you know i remember sitting in his office uh, you know people there tape recording every conversation to make sure that you get the quotes right uh, he was an interesting character john mcdonough but it was it was to do one of those revival of the blackhawk stories and and because he was you know like he was from chicago but he but he was working for the the baseball team the cubs at at, at the time and so you know like he would be trying to give me the history of, of it and it's like okay i was there at the chicago stadium and and i was you know and i know what it was and i was also there in the early days of the united center and i knew what what a mausoleum that it had become. Yep. So you don't have to fill me in on, on the details. I saw it at its peak and I saw it, you know, where, where it just fell off the face of the earth. And I think that that was one of the, the things that was kind of like a crying shame for the national hockey league. You only have the six original six teams and, and the legacy of the other five were, were still great. Even, you know, Detroit, when they were suffering as the, the dead things and, and, and the gray wings, it was still, yeah. not as bad as chicago at, yeah. at the very bottom and and i do think and plus you know they tried that rebuild several different times right so Kyle you know they calder tried calder and bell sure yeah the, the abc line tyler arneson mark bell and and uh, kyle calder they, yeah. they were supposed to be the the the, the building blocks and that yeah. just it didn't work out and then they had to start over again so really the cane taves part was the rebuild within the rebuild or the yep. rebuild after the rebuild which is really hard to do to go back to square one twice yep. in a in a very short period of time that's organizationally you better get it right and they did because those two guys were everything that they you know they hoped that they would be and and more and then i think the other thing is that there was there was a dynamic between the two of them you know, they didn't always play together five on five, but whenever Joel Quenville needed a goal, he would put them out there five on five. They were dynamic on, on the power play. They had different personalities. You know, Kane was that carefree mm -hmm. guy and Taves was captain. <laughs> serious. serious. And, yeah. and, and it was just like the yin and yang of those two guys together. Though the, People always talk about chemistry and, and that, that, that's the thing that you cannot forecast. You know, you, you grab Kane first overall, you get Taves third overall. You don't know whether these guys are going to work out together or clash. You don't know. Yeah. And, and, and it did, it worked out, it worked out perfectly. And so that to me is always one of the, the real tests of, of, of team building. And, and, and not only that, you know, like the randomness of it, you know, mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, if, if, if Taves went third overall, you know, what if, you know, you know, he'd gone first overall instead of Eric yep. Johnson, uh, could have changed the entire dynamic of, uh, of two organizations really. So, uh, so, and I actually, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about that because most of us are going to be writing a lot more about Connor Bedard in the next. <laughs> I don't know why. Well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That you saw the goal. Uh, it looked like Mario Lemieux against the uh, Minnesota North stars, didn't it? 
Which one? Okay. Oh, a couple uh, games ago, he split the literally uh, yeah, physically yeah. split the two. You know what? So I, I've seen him. You know, like it, it's great because the networks are are are, are running highlights of of yeah. all of their playoff games, and ev every night there's another one, that right? Trick. So, I, I, that trick. But the, so that's why I was a little bit like, which one are you talking <laughs> yeah, about? Yeah, that's a lot, true. There's Fair a enough. lot to choose from yeah. there. So, um, but but it was interesting because. Uh, you know, the, uh, I was watching the, the TNT broadcast a couple or three weeks ago, and and this is this point has been made by a lot of people in the past. But I thought Henrik Lundqvist made it in, in a very compelling mm. way, which is that you know it's one thing, you know, to draft a player like that, but immediately you need to surround him with with mm -hmm. the right people because the, the the one way of really getting it wrong is to is to not have the kind of uh, correct veteran leadership in, in in the dressing room to and and so you know then you look at the at the various teams that are in contention Columbus is in contention Chicago's in contention Anaheim's in contention San Jose's in contention do mm. they have the right supporting mm. uh, group and if they don't you know the onus will be on the respective general managers mm. to go out and and get those players and the only thing I would tell you is that in some of those some of those markets it's not that difficult to recruit players to but if if you have Connor Bedard as your shiny bobble, here's Connor Bedard, you yeah. know, come and join us and be part of what we're building here. That will be very attractive to players who hit free agency this, uh, this summer. So, you know, if you're San Jose and, uh, and, and you get, Connor Bedard, I think all of a sudden, you know, it will be a lot easier for Mike Greer to go out and, and sign oh, for sure. or bring in the right kind of players. And then some teams have them already in place. You know, last year, I thought a lot of, there was if, if he hadn't been hurt probably anaheim would have traded adam henrique who i think is a really good leader and i've known him since his new jersey days um you know probably that you know if if they don't get bedard they might trade him in the summer but if they do get bedard then you've got, already got a piece there you like you've got a yeah. henrique and you and you want a couple more yeah. uh guys like that so uh drafting Connor bedard for one team is going to be like a complete home run and then will also i think open the door uh, to, to just make it easier to to get the you know the right kind of players to surround him with, and so you know that that is that's the fast track to success as far as I'm concerned. If Chicago gets some, would that influence Taves? Maybe would you Possibly. want it? Would you want to stick around oh, to yeah, well, groom him? Well, that, put it this way: if, if you're the that general, could be a legacy <laughs> piece too. If you're if you're the general manager in Chicago and Jonathan Taves is is thinking about it, what you're saying right now is well, first of all, they're still playing, right? Right, so, absolutely. So take your time. Yeah, we'll know on May the eighth. Yep. who wins the draft lottery? We'll know by then. You know, so then as Jonathan Taves makes his decision this summer, one of the things that he'll have to factor is. You know, Connor Bedard is coming in, and you know, like, you know, you, you need to find, uh, you know, that energy, right? You need to find that passion again, and and possibly having a, a player of his ilk, you know, like a, you know, a young, you know, maybe the next Connor McDavid or or whatever, you know, that could be just the the tipping point in in terms of getting someone who's you know listing towards retirement to think, yeah, maybe another year or two, because you're right, Jonathan Taves is the perfect oh. guy in terms of of setting a standard. For a young player coming in, absolutely, and and I would guess that that if if Chicago does get Connor Bedard, one of the first orders of business will be Jonathan. You know, come on back. You know, come on back. So, you know, my love of obscure story—not necessarily obscure stories, but stories that nobody else is talking about. Uh -huh. Okay, what have we got? <laughs> Comes from the Athletic. Uh -huh. We're staying in Chicago. Uh -huh. The Chicago Wolves. Mm -hmm are going to go all independent next year in the American yeah. Hockey League. First yeah. time since 94, 95. Right. Yeah, the yeah. old IHL would have had independent teams yeah. too. Um, I don't know what to make of this. It, it just seemed like the whole minor league system had run its course, and now the AHL was there to serve the NHL. Right. And yet, you know, I read the quotes from Wendell Young, who's been there for a long time. They won last year. They beat Stockton. Yeah. Um, but they don't want to lose. Yeah. So now they're going to go independent. Yeah. Is that is that crazy? Is that weird? Is that? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I I don't know if it's crazy or weird. I, I do think that there's there are an awful lot of players who are great AHL players who never get a chance at at, at the National Hockey League level. And so <laughs> we got one here. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Matt Phillips. Right. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, uh, so the the you know I, I think. Probably every AHL team has somebody like that, yeah, or, or a couple that that are like that. And so, so think about it. If you're the Chicago Wolves, and if you're a player, you know, 25, 26, 27, you know that your best hope is like an NHL cup of coffee, 
Um, and so you have an opportunity to live in Chicago, you know, play with other players that are, that are like you. you so it's probably going to be a, like an extreme winning environment. Um, I, I think they'll, they'll beat up on the league. To be I do too. To, yeah, yeah, I do. Because, you know, everybody else is going to be in that development mode and you have to be right. The whole idea of, of having a minor league team is to make sure that every year you can feed, you know, one or two, you know, Walker Durs or, or, yeah. or Jacob Pelches into your lineup, because that's the only way of, you know, of, of sustaining any kind of consistency in, in the national hockey league. So if, but, but if you, you know, if you're not going to be that guy, like, if, you know, if you're in that next group of, of forwards, that's just kind of there to, you know, to ride shotgun for these young guys that are being groomed to, to play in the national hockey league. And the option is to, to go and play in a, in a great city for a team that's probably going to win lots. Um, yeah. I, I, I see nothing but like incredible success for them. Do they have a salary cap in the American Hockey League? Not that I'm aware of, but I they, I know they I, have I, rules in terms of the amount of players you can sure, have with the experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean there there will be uh ways of of navigating around. Are they going to spend more on players in Arizona? That's what I'm asking. Well, uh, no. <laughs> oh, well, actual players or, or contracts that are actual on the book. Actual players. Okay, actual players. Well, it could be close, you know. I mean that, that that's the crazy thing about Arizona's payroll is that it's, you know, it is inflated by how Having all of these contracts on it that that are, are mirages, right? You know, they they have a salary cap number that doesn't even reflect what the actual compensation is. You know, the salary cap number is five point five. The compensation in the final year of the contract is a million dollars. And then, you know, and in the case of a number of them, their the contracts are insured, so you're not really on the hook for for very much. So, yeah, there is a salary cap game being played in the National Hockey League, and I, I, I'm just not familiar enough with the mechanics yeah. of the AHL to be able to tell you one way or another. I do think there are rules, and but I think that those rules are, are still give them the opportunity to attract the best, you know, you know, 25 to 28 year old players in in the league, you know, pay you know a competitive salary and 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 just create an, an attractive work environment for them. I might be the only person that is thinking this way, but I wonder if Hershey and some of these other traditional American sure. Hockey League franchises that were for a long time they were mostly independent with yeah. six mm -hmm. or seven yeah. affiliated players. I wonder if they follow suit. That's a good point. Well, uh, you know, what I will tell you is that hockey at every level uh, it tends to be copycat. So if, if <laughs> yes, if one true. if one organization has success uh, doing that, then then others presumably will follow suit. Welcome to the Oodle Noodle Studio. Oh yeah, nice here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You like this? Loop, eh? yes, 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 yeah. I, I, I was impressed. I was, uh, by the way, though, you gave me one bit of bad information. What? No street parking to speak of. Nothing. I, well, the, those guys with the, the, all those guys with the free vehicles in the show before me, they all left before you got here. Well, part, lots of uh, well uh, put it this way. It's a beautiful day. And, and that, that, <laughs> that, that, that 12 minute walk didn't really. Oh, bother my me. gosh. OK. <laughs> if I can okay. only remember where I parked. Yeah. Because it's way over there. <laughs> um, but the rest of it is great. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and of course, we can read you in the athletic. Uh, I, sh I just a shout out. And uh, normally I shout out your stuff. I just want to shout out uh, Fludo's uh, column yesterday on Hallmark on the two inches. Have you had a chance to read no, that? No. Oh, I love that kind of, yeah. you know, gets in the weeds with Bob Essenza yeah. and talks about here's a guy that was like 38th in save percentage yeah. and now is going to win the Vesna right. two inches. Yeah, it's fantastic. That's what you get out of the athletic. Okay, you well, get well, the ninety nine and and that kind of writing out of the athletic. Yeah, well, and then the one thing I would tell you is that even as someone that works there, um, we have forty plus hockey writers producing a lot of copy, and it's difficult for me to read everything. No kidding. Written by my colleagues. Yeah, you know, it's there's a lot out there. So yeah, you know, I guess th this is my turn for a shameless promotion. If you care about the game, and especially and especially if you care about the minutia of the game. You know, we have we have quite a bit of really interesting stuff out there, and some young people that I really admire. You know, like I, you know, Shana Goldman, and Don Lucician are, mm -hmm. are, you know, I've been working with them on on various trade boards and, and different projects uh, the last couple of years, and and I've really come to appreciate um, how smart they are and uh, they're mathematical geniuses. You know, we have these these skull sessions, and uh, you know, they they could teach math at university. Sure. <laughs> and I was a good math student. <laughs> no, I'm not. You know, so. I was a good math student uh but they're phenomenal so yeah yeah anyway enough of that um uh, we told you we got a general manager for the halifax killer uh, uh seals that's trent mcclellan uh did you get any feedback on your six 
I'll call them on the six possible expansion locations. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, that was, and it was a couple of, weeks ago, but yeah, well, it was, it, 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 it was the, by far the most a red story that I've written this year by far. Like, really? Oh, off the top. Yeah. And, and I, and I believe it sold the most subscriptions of everything I read. Yeah. No, it touched a nerve. It touched nerves everywhere. So I love it. So yes, I got quite a bit of reaction to it. In fact, I think somebody at the, you know, can you do versions of that more regularly? And it's like, <laughs> I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to be able to, Yeah. I don't think you can go to down that well too often, but, uh, but no, it, it, uh, it popped. You get it to popped, the, as we like to say. You get to the point where we're talking about Weyburn and Banff this week. I don't, yeah. yeah. I don't think it works. That won't work. No. no. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks okay. for coming in. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Eric DeHatchik, everybody from the 